Hey guys, hope you're doing well out there. Earnings season is almost in full swing, but before we get the earnings from the major banks and your mega cap tech, we get a window into one of the most consistent and predictable consumer staples out there, and that is PepsiCo Incorporated. Over the past one year, you're seeing shares down nearly 11%, trading close to their 52 week lows. And consider the fact that this company had been making a pattern of higher highs and higher lows over the last 14 years. Yeah, you have a nearly 14 year uptrend over at Pepsi that has just now been broken as you have two red candles over the past two months closing underneath that uptrending channel. So you've also seen significant amount of sideways consolidation in the stock. So from a stock perspective, if you own shares of Pepsi at this point, do you take your profit since you've significantly underperformed the market over the past, call it three to five years? Or is this the time where you step in and hope this one continues back into this channel and sees a further rally upward? We're certainly going to answer that question from a technical perspective. We'll also take a look at their financials, see how this company really is performing on their income statement, balance sheet, and cash flows. We'll take a look at the future growth prospects of Pepsi, discuss their valuation, and a whole lot more. As always, if you're new to the channel and find this type of content valuable, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button below. It would be much appreciated. Shares of Pepsi, like we said, down nearly 11% over the past one year, trading close to their 52-week lows. Even year to date, you are down nearly 3%. Consider the fact that you do get a 3.3% forward yield on this one on a per share basis. That's close to $5.42. Now, their Q2 results came out and it was essentially a mixed bag as you had a revenue miss of $100 million as revenues came in at $22.5 billion. That was good for just 0.8% growth year over year. Now that is on a reported basis. When you strip out any acquisitions that this company did over the past 12 months and you look at it purely on an organic revenue perspective, that came in at 1.9% growth. So nearly not as bad, but still just very minimal growth at one, call it 2% from an organic perspective, at least on that revenue side. Now where they did come in with a surprise upside beat is on the bottom line as non-GAAP EPS came in at $2.28. That was a beat of roughly 12 cents as estimates on Wall Street we're closer to $2.16. So a miss on the top line, a beat on the bottom line, sort of a mixed bag. In terms of forward looking guidance, this was Pepsi's Q2. And so they have two remaining quarters for full year 2024. They're anticipating organic revenue growth for the full year to come in at 4%. Keep in mind this quarter, they came in at 2%. And so they're expecting the third and fourth quarter from an earnings perspective, pardon me, from a revenue growth perspective to be slightly better than the first half of the year. And that is promising if you are a PepsiCo shareholder. That also came in above the consensus estimate, which was closer to 3.9% organic revenue growth. And this is really an important number over at Pepsi. They have such a large product portfolio of so many brands that they own. You want to see at least a modest growth rate on that revenue side on their organic brands like their Pepsi beverage, like Quaker, like Tostitos, Gatorade, and things of that nature. So you do want to see significant, at least higher than 1% to 2% growth on an organic side for Pepsi and they're certainly looking to promise that for the full year for the remainder of 2024. They also came in basically in line to their adjusted EPS guidance for the full year at $8.15. Expectations were closer to $8.16 and they remain confident in exceeding that 8% EPS growth for the full year of 2024. This company also doing a significant amount of shareholder returns that is in the form of dividends and share buybacks as you expect close to 7.2 billion in dividends and then a small $1 billion buyback. We'll take a look at that more when we get onto their income statement. Now, while this quarter over at Pepsi was really mixed in terms of a revenue and earning perspective, I think what's moving the needle over at this company, or pardon me, what's not moving the needle in terms of its stock price over at this company is the fact that the growth over at Pepsi has really sort of stalled out in that low single digits percent. As you look ahead to the next couple of quarters, revenue growth in this upcoming Q3 anticipated to be roughly 3.3%. And then in the subsequent Q4, which is the holiday time period for Pepsi, one of their largest quarters expected to be just 4.69%. So you're never even breaching that midpoint single digit growth at 5%. And I think that's really your upside if you own shares of Pepsi. If this company can outpace that revenue growth expectations, not by a whole lot, just even by one or two percentage points, come up to 5% revenue growth, I think that will make a significant difference, at least on their earnings side, as really the earnings are anticipated to grow in that seven, call it up to 8%, really over the next three to four quarters. And so certainly the earnings growth isn't the issue over at Pepsi. It's over the next couple of years, how will this company get back into revenue acceleration higher than just two to 3%?
if they can look to outpace revenue growth expectations from 3%, call it up to just 5% over the next couple of years, I think that will certainly be enough to move the needle over at Pepsi as that will drive significant amount of earnings growth over at this company, liking, likely driving them north of 10% on that bottom line. And so maybe it'll take some strategic marketing initiatives or maybe a new innovation pipeline over at Pepsi or the fact that they'll continue to do more acquisitions. But I think outpacing on that revenue growth expectations is really how this company can continue and get back to outpacing from its stock price perspective. Now, what you also get with Pepsi is extremely consistent dividend growth. And so while this company doesn't have the AI hype or really any tech hype behind it, I think it has a really predictable and stable product portfolio that allows it to generate just large amounts of free cash flow and earnings. And what that leads to is large amounts of dividend growth over a couple of years. And so as an investor, if you are focused more towards value or dividends or dividend growth, or let's say you just have a lot of tech exposure in your portfolio, I think a name like Pepsi gives you that consistent dividend income that you can continue to reinvest back into itself or maybe look to invest in other parts of your portfolio. And so you anticipate, call it somewhere between six up to 10% year over year dividend growth at Pepsi. And that's really what you've experienced over the past couple of years. That's really what you can anticipate moving forward. And on a forward basis, we said $5.42 in terms of that forward dividend. And on a full year earnings per share, you're getting $8.16. So while the payout ratio for this company is over 50%, closer to 60%, I think you still have room to continue to grow your dividend as long as you are growing your bottom line earnings, call it somewhere in the seven up to 9% over the next couple of years. So you can certainly expect Pepsi to continue spitting out that dividend and increasing it, call it in the high single digits over the next couple of years. Moving on to the statement of income, we have that $22.5 billion in net revenues for the most recent quarter. That's for the 12 weeks ended on this left-hand column. On the right side, we see 24 weeks ended. That means the last six months over at Pepsi or the last two quarters. And so we see year over year on a three month basis, basically revenues looking right around flat up from 22.3 up to 22 and a half billion dollars, slightly better on a six month basis as you have revenues come up from 40.16 billion up to 40.75. Now, I think where Pepsi has extremely good leverage is on their gross margin and operating margin side. And that's exactly what we see from this most recent quarter and the last six months. You see on higher revenues, your cost of sales actually tick down year over year. That is impressive to see from a company that actually produces physical goods. You oftentimes don't even see this at tech companies. So the fact that Pepsi raised their net revenues while lowering their cost of sales helped their gross margins and their gross profit increase as you saw basically nearly dollar for dollar and more of your net revenues flowing down to your gross profit as that came in at 12.58 billion last year you were at 12.2 on a six month window looks pretty identical as you have gross profit coming up half a billion dollars despite growing your net revenues nearly 600 million dollars so a lot of those net revenue dollars coming down to their gross profit line and so that is exactly what i meant by the upside over at pepsi is how can they increase their revenue growth year over year from just 3% up to call it 5%. A lot of those additional revenue dollars will come down to their gross profit just because this company is already scaled out. They've already made out those manufacturing facilities. They already have a fantastic distribution network. And so the hard part with these food and beverage companies is getting to scale. But the fact that PepsiCo has already achieved that, they've done the hard part, they're already at scale, that allows them to increase their net revenues without really budging on their cost of those sales, allowing gross profit and gross margins to expand thoroughly. And so that is, I think, I think the upside with Pepsi is you can expect continuous revenue increases while maintaining your cost of sales relatively in check, increasing those gross margins over time. Now, that's not the full story. You also have SG&A expenses, which again, another operating lever over at PepsiCo is the fact that they can control these marketing back office and employee expenses so, so well. As you saw, SG&A actually taking down year over year, allowing operating profits to increase even faster then their gross profits increased coming up to four point call it 4.05 billion dollars last year you were at 3.65 billion dollars so not only did this company reduce their cost of sales year over year they also declined on their sgna expenses all while increasing those net revenues and so that is impressive to see this company having such terrific operating leverage even so late into their existence similar story on a six month basis as you have operating profit come up to 6.76 billion last year you were at 6.2, you 
your SGNA on a six month basis didn't quite go down, but was relatively flat when you especially compare it to how much they expanded those net revenues. Now, you also have a fair amount of debt over at this company. We'll take a look at that on their balance sheet, but they are paying a large amount of net interest expense on that debt, considering the fact that interest rates remain really high. This company paying close to $234 million in just the most recent quarter on that debt. And then you add on some income tax expenses and you get to net income attributable to Pepsi at right around $3.1 billion. So I think interest rates actually play a significant portion in keeping the stock, I think at least keeping a lid on the stock over the near term. Because you have this company with such a large amount of debt that the interest rates really certainly affect the portion of that debt, especially if they were at a floating rate, that will increase your net interest expense year over year meaningfully on that debt. Along with the interest rates affecting how much you pay on your debt, it certainly also affects your consumer that are buying the PepsiCo end products like those bag of Lay's and a Pepsi beverage. The fact that interest rates remain higher probably pinches the consumer a little bit more and before that you had high inflation again affecting the consumer that's in my opinion what's leading to this very small and minimal revenue growth year over year you have probably some consumers trading down to the store brand in order to save a couple pennies where they can and trade away from name brands like a pepsi co so when certainly you have interest rates come down i think that can be beneficial to a company like pepsi both in terms of financing that debt and also helping out their core customers come back to more name brands like a PepsiCo. In terms of their different subsidiaries, they own certainly a lot of different brands. And so Frito-Lay North America, which includes things like Cheetos, Doritos, Lay's, of course, and other snacking items, that actually saw a decline year over year coming down to 5.87 billion. Last year, you were at 5.9. On a full year, pardon me, six month basis, looking slightly better as you do have revenues up but just modestly on a year over year basis. This is also the part of their business that is the cash flowing beast as over the last six months on $11.5 billion in revenues, you churned out 3.15 billion in operating profit. Now, what you don't like to see is operating profits year over year declining despite maintaining those revenues at a roughly flat pace. So you wanna see your revenues increase and then you wanna see your operating profits on that business line increase at a faster clip. Where this company really is struggling is on that Quaker Foods side, that is their breakfast portfolio, things like granola and oatmeal. They did issue a voluntary recall on those Quaker food items over the past year. And so you see that business really just falling off the cliff down from $680 million last year, now down to 560, also showing up on their operating side as that side of their business basically becoming break even from an operating perspective. At some point, Pepsi will certainly have to make once again a big push into that breakfast item with their Quaker Foods line of business. If not, they'll continue to lose money on that, eventually maybe even turning to an operating loss. At that point, I think it's better to just offload that business altogether if they aren't able to revive sales for their breakfast portfolio. What is still remaining strong is the core PepsiCo beverage portfolio that includes Pepsi, Aquafina, Gatorade, those sort of beverages as revenues still ticking up year over year on a modest basis, both on a three month and six month basis. As you see six month revenues coming at 12.68 billion, still expanding operating profits in that line of business. Now you do have still operating expansions in Latin America and especially in Europe. As you see, Europe revenues come up to three and a half billion. Last year they were at 3.4 and you expanded your operating profits in those geographies nearly almost as fast. And so Latin America and Europe certainly looking like two bright spots outside of North America for Pepsi, where they still are struggling though, is in the Africa, Middle East region. And then also in Australia, as you see, operating profits slightly flat to down in those regions year over year. So this company taking ground in Latin America and Europe, but losing in other parts of the world. And then in North America, staying essentially flat on a year over year basis. In terms of the cash flows, we have a six month picture on the left hand side is the most recent six months. Right hand side, you're looking at the first six months of 2023. We have that five point, call it $5.15 billion in net income over the last six months. We add back a fair amount of depreciation you have large distribution centers and warehouses that Pepsi owns. You add that back in, you also add some stock-based compensation and restructuring back in. You essentially get to net cash provided by operating activities at $1.3 billion. Last year, you were closer to $2 billion. So it seems like they took a hit on that operating cash flow. Some of that seems to be due to that product recall on the Quaker side. Could also be due to tax payments related to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And then some of it is just due to the fact that now they have more accounts payable 
than they did a year ago. So that operating cash flow actually coming down quite significantly, I'd say not one you can expect or at least should expect to decline every single quarter. I think this was more of a one-off quarter where they saw significant declines on their operating cash flows. Now you also have additional CapEx spending over at PepsiCo as they're still expending on that property planting equipment side to the tune of $1.7 billion last year. That spend was closer to 1.5. So this company from a free cash flow perspective actually over the most recent quarter did become free cash flow negative as they spent 1.7 billion on CapEx and earned just 1.3 in operating cash flow. So the fact that this company turned free cash flow negative just for this last quarter, I think is not a great sign and certainly shows that this company needs to get back into that revenue growth acceleration ahead of just one to 2% growth. They also need to get back into that breakfast category and recover from those Quaker Oats product recalls. Now you also have some financing activities as they took on some long-term debt, paid off some long-term debt. So it looks like just refinanced a portion of that and then you have a big three and a half billion dollars in terms of cash dividend paid over the last 24 weeks or six months coming in well ahead of same time last year where you paid close to 3.2 billion dollars in terms of cash dividends and so while this company is doing a small share buyback to the tune of roughly half a billion dollars for six months and they anticipate one billion dollars for the full year you are still growing the amount of dividends you pay despite retiring some of your shares and that comes back to the fact that this company continuously grows that dividend call it somewhere between six to seven percent year over year and as someone looking to generate some passive income from your investments i think a company like pepsi does that perfectly through their cash dividends paid and so year over year you saw your cash pile decrease call it roughly 3.3 billion dollars down from 97 now down to 6.4 billion dollars a lot of that going straight through into your cash dividends paid as this company turned basically from generating positive free cash flow to negative free cash flow over the last six months from a balance sheet perspective not looking great it's not looking too concerning but certainly not the best balance sheet you can find out there you have 6.3 billion in cash and equivalents you see inventory is actually ticking up year over year up to 5.9 billion dollars last year you were closer to 5.3 billion dollars so when your sales are growing at just one percent on a reported basis and close to 2% organically, and you're growing your inventories by call it 10%. Again, not something I like to see, growing your inventories while not growing your sales nearly as fast. And so I think Pepsi can do a better job moving through some of this inventory instead of having it build up. Partially that increase could also be due to the fact that this company just getting a bit ahead of their Q4 where they have to stock in for that Halloween and Christmas time period. Now, total current assets coming in at $25.7 billion. That's compared to total current liabilities right around $30, $31 billion. So more current liabilities than current assets. Keep that in mind. But a lot of that is in the form of inventories. And then a lot of your liabilities are in the form of accounts payable. So not necessarily short-term debt, although they do still have close to $8.3 billion of that. On top of that, close to $36.6 billion in long-term debt. That is leading to that nearly $200 million net interest paid on that debt portion. So certainly if they can look to bring down this debt, which seems to be tough over at Pepsi, especially when they're not generating really any free cash flow. I think the fact that they'll continue to pay large amounts of interest on this debt while interest rates remain high, that will certainly keep a lid on the stock price, in my opinion. Now, speaking of stock price, over the last three years, you've basically been going sideways with shares of Pepsi. And like we said at the start, you've now broken a nearly 14 year uptrend. And so having just breached this nearly decade long uptrend, can you now say that PepsiCo is confirming a long term downtrend? I certainly wouldn't go as far as saying you can confirm a downtrend because you have been making a pattern of lower highs, but that hasn't been confirmed with some lower lows. Certainly if PepsiCo comes in here and significantly breaks underneath this $157 range and comes down close to $250, then yeah, I think you can say pretty convincingly that this uptrend is over and now Pepsi will continue to trade in a downtrend of lower highs and lower lows. But until that downtrend is confirmed by candle, I'd say closer to this $150 range. I think this green box, which is a level of consolidation, is a region where you can pick up shares of Pepsi, at least as a long-term buy and hold investor. Certainly if you're looking to trade in and out of Pepsi, this probably wasn't the video you were looking for. But certainly if you are patient and are looking for passive income in the form of dividends while you wait, I think picking up shares of Pepsi at these levels closer to $160 a share certainly could make a lot of sense. I would set a stop loss 
call it right at $150 because you certainly don't want Pepsi to breach that and you'll confirm a downtrend. And so if you pick up shares of Pepsi at the current level, close to $160, $263 a share, I think your first level of stop loss, if you're really concerned, can be closer to $157. And then if you are a little bit more okay with some downside risk and don't want to get stopped out too early, I think a hard stop loss at $150 should be in place and you're hoping for your rebound back into this uptrending channel in order for Pepsi to continue making higher highs and higher lows. I think what you have with this company is very consistent and predictable revenues over the next couple of years in that 3 to 4% growth. Your upside is if they can get to close to 5% revenue growth and then that will lead to call it close to double digit growth on that bottom line near 8 to 10%. And I think that is how you get shares of Pepsi to once again head back into this uptrend and continue to make higher highs and higher lows. And while you're in this green box, you can continue to certainly hold your shares, accumulate more and more over time. And while you do that, you consistently get growth on the dividends on your shares. That was my take on shares of PepsiCo. One I do actually really like in terms of a value and dividend growth perspective. Certainly doesn't have the same breakneck growth of a tech company, but also has a pretty reasonable valuation at a 20 times earnings multiple. And I think if you can outpace on your revenue growth expectations just by even a percentage point or two, I think that is your upside with shares of Pepsi and one that can continue back in this uptrend over the next near future. That was my take on shares of PepsiCo. Let me know your thoughts on this one in the comment section below. We'll be back with more earnings as we're just heading into Q2 earnings season. So stay tuned on the channel. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't. As always, thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you guys in the next video.